Well, hello, this is Justin Frickty, forage and cover crop specialist with Millborn Seeds. Uh, understanding the cover crop buzz is really what we're going to talk about here in this presentation. And this is one of the topics that we covered pretty heavily when we are out on the road uh, giving these winter workshops. And so just wanted to, uh, you know, if you weren't able to make it to the winter workshop or if you wanted to go back and look at something on this topic, uh, wanted to get it up on the internet so you could do that, um, go back and, and, and learn something if you missed them, okay? So what we're going to be covering is really why is this taking off? What is the talk all about? If it's still something you haven't learned about, um, giving you a good education about the whole idea of these cover crops. And, and I guess these are the three big bullet points that I see why cover crops have really gained a lot of momentum and have gained popularity. The first one up there is land value. And, and we know that that's increased, okay? It's hard to go to an auction and afford a piece of land these days. Uh, that's because what we have for land is what there's, what there's going to be. There's not going to be any more land, okay? So we have to take care of it. We have to utilize it for everything that it can possibly give us. Uh, so that means maximizing the potential of that piece of land, um, and that means taking care of it so that it's there for future generations. Okay, the other big reason is that there's, you know, the sun is that one thing that we can use and it's still free and we're not taxed on it. We can harvest all the energy that we want from it um, and not have to pay a dime for it, okay? So we have to take advantage of it by growing something. And the last bullet point you see is diverse year-round growth. Okay, before our soil was used for farm ground, it was a native prairie. That prairie was extremely diverse, you know, ranging from a variety of cool season and warm season grasses to forbs and all these different plants well, made up uh, that, that ecological habitat for that soil. And, and, and so since we're now in these rotations of maybe three or possibly even two crops on that soil, if we have the opportunity to, to put in one more crop, increase the diversity that we're, that we're promoting within that soil, that's going to be a good thing. So we're increasing one more rotation, but within that rotation we're introducing a whole, uh, just a whole lot of different species, okay? That's why we're having these mixes of cover crops go on. So cover crop's not a new practice by any means. I mean, it's been done for hundreds of years, but the way we're doing cover crops now has really changed, okay? And the big reason for that change is because rather than using monocultures to try to create organic matter or fix nitrogen and calling it a green manure type of a practice, now we're doing things in blends or cocktails where we're combining lots of different species and we're trying to achieve multiple goals and now rather than calling them individual practices like a catch crop or a cover crop or green manure, uh, since we're doing all these things at once with multiple species at the same planting, we've just coined that term under the same umbrella as a cover crop. And that's really the practice of which it is. All right, so before we get further into this talk, the one term that you probably need to understand is what a brassica is. Okay, and what that is, is just a genus, a genus. And those plants within that genus include things like radishes and turnips and rape and kale. All those are species that we've really incorporated into these cover crop plantings, and, and we're seeing lots of good results by using plants that are in that brassica family. Okay, this is a big thing that really the reason why cover crops have taken off is because they make sense from a conservation standpoint and they make sense from a production standpoint. Oftentimes I think farmers have kind of gotten a bad reputation for, you know, for not taking care of their soil or not taking care of their environment and being too business mind focused. Now, and I think that's, that's baloney, you know, I mean, me and my grandpa and my dad, you know, farming and taking care of the soil you know, taking care of that soil has, has always been a main priority to us. And I think that's the same with a lot of folks, a lot of farmers. Okay, so, you know, a couple bad apples can really ruin the crop, and that's the same thing here. But cover crops have, have gained the attention from folks like the NRCS and the Fish and Wildlife Service and Game Fish and Parks because they understand that it's good for the soil, it's good for the environment, and so they like the practice of cover crops being utilized by farmers. 
But I fully understand that this has to make sense from a bottom line, bottom line standpoint. It has to make us more profitable. It has to make us more efficient. And it has to make sense from a production standpoint. Otherwise, there's really no sense of doing it. Okay, so co cover crops make sense from both of those viewpoints, and that's really why they've gained popularity. This is a pretty bold statement by FDR, and um, it says a lot about taking care of our soil, and that's really why the cover, cover crops, uh, that's really what they're doing. They're taking care of that soil because as a farmer, as a landowner, you know, more than anything, you probably want to leave a legacy, and you know that that soil has to be in place for you to be able to do that pass that land on to, on to the next generation. Okay, so how do we get degraded soils or how, why are we actually trying to improve them at this, at this stage in the game? Well, number one, you know, through tillage or erosion, what we're doing is we're opening up that soil, we're allowing more aerobic bacteria to come into play, or we're putting that um, organic matter on top of the soil back into the soil so we're increasing the rate of which it's being broken down when that happens we decrease our orga organic matter and so as we decrease those organic matter particles within our soil those aggregates break down or your physical structure within that soil profile begins to break down you don't have those various sizes of particles and so that soil becomes compacted and we see that a lot in fields right now with, with compacted surfaces we have less water infiltration we know that those roots aren't penetrating so they're not as drought tolerant because they can't reach down through that soil profile and and use moisture reserves down there and so breaking up that compaction issues or, or trying to get that water infiltration is a huge part of um, these orga this whole organic matter or even the cover crop talk. Alright, so selecting your cover crop seed is really what we're going to kind of focus on through the rest of the presentation here. And, and we're going to go through the six steps, I guess, to, to, to help you select those cover crop seeds. So the first one and the main one we're going to focus on is figuring out your project goal. Um, you know, when something new comes along like this, a, a whole new practice, what I don't want to see is people just doing cover crops because it sounds neat or it sounds cool. You really have to have a goal in mind and you have to be wanting to accomplish something with those fields so that you get the correct species out there. And you can see those goals there. I mean, are you going to just try to plant a cover crop to, to make some organic matter or fix compaction? Do you want to use up moisture or do you want to try to conserve moisture do you want to plant legumes to fix nitrogen all those things up there are, are really going to determine what type of species you're going to put out okay so the first one that we're going to focus is on is producing organic matter and really your, your whole organic matter is that's your foundation of your soil that's what carries you through tough times that's what gives you that extra boost in terms of nutrients in terms of fertilizer late in the year as it breaks down uh, and, and so what we're trying to focus on is your fresh residue percentage um, by, by planting cover crops that's the one that you're going to boost the most um, because your fresh residue within your soil that part of your organic matter those are the things that have just died so your living organisms whether it's a root from a plant or an earthworm or a protozoa or fungi or bacteria those things that have just died that are now turned into your fresh residue or freshly dead um, organisms within the soil. Okay, so then uh, as it decomposes, you know, then it goes into that larger fracture of um, of more decomposing organic matter before it's turned into your actual stabilized organic matter or your humus, which is by far the most important part of your soil. All right, so why is or increasing your organic matter actually important what is it doing for us in terms of benefiting us okay so as we in introduce more organic matter to that soil we're gonna have more biological activity all right as we increase the amount of food for that soil we increase the population of that bio biology within that soil all right that makes perfect sense okay so when we have more things to eat organic matter, your decomposition is going to increase, okay? And when we do that, 
we have more decomposing things, that's when we're going to see more aggregation within that soil. We're going to see uh, more various sized particles. We're going to have, uh, you know, more pore spaces within those various sizes. That's what that aggregation is. Okay, and, and we know when we have that increased aggregation, it improves that whole physical structure of the soil or that tilth of the soil, and that ultimately is what increases our water storage, our water infiltration, and that is why we can have better root penetration within that profile. So that, in a big picture, is why we want to increase our organic matter. Okay, so if you don't know what your organic matter percentage is, you should do soil tests and figure out what it is. Farm average, you can see up there in South Dakota, in eastern South Dakota, you know, we're, we're in the range of, of four to six as we move westward. You know, then we're dropping to the two, threes, possibly some in the fours. Uh, but the main thing that we want to take away is it, whenever we can increase that organic matter by at least 1%, you can have up to a 12% crop yield increase. Okay, so that makes a big difference. If, let's just take, for, for example, 100 bushel corn yield. We can boost our organic ma matter levels by 1%. You know, we're talking about 112 bushel corn yield. You know, at six bucks a bushel, that pays pretty big dividends. We're talking 60 bucks an acre. All right, so the plants that are really going to increase our organic matter um, are mainly our grasses. For one, their root system is more of a fibrous or branch rooted root system. Okay, so you get a lot of that fresh residues. Uh, the other thing is that plant is, is made up of a higher percentage of carbon than it is nitrogen, so the rate of which it's going to break down is slower. So over time that allows you to have more carbon out there and have more organic matter because it's breaking down at a slower rate, um, which over time is going to yield you a higher percentage of organic matter. Okay. So moisture management, this is kind of the next step of, or, the, or the next goal that you might want to accomplish by planting a cover crop. And it, you can see up there this quote, this is by far the biggest question that I'm receiving right now is, okay, so it was pretty wet when I planted the cover crop. We've seen a lot of plant, a lot of uh, prevent plant acres uh, have a cover crop planted onto them because they were so wet. We wanted to utilize some of that moisture, use it up. Okay, but now that faucet turned off, we haven't had a real good rain since the end of June, and uh, we're actually in a drought here in eastern South Dakota. So, guys are saying, well, should I have plants and cover crops? Am I hurting myself for spring moisture? And that's really the question I want to address. Okay, so this is a study done by the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, and what they did is they did some um, moisture readings throughout soil profiles on a field that did have a cover crop and a field that did not have a cover crop. And you can see that the total amount of moisture they had within that soil profile with a cover crop is 3.07 inches. And where they did not have a cover crop, they had 3.11 inches. So without a cover crop, you know, they conserved about four one hundredths of an inch of, of moisture. Okay, so then they did this out in pier as well. Um, and you can see it changed just a little bit. Where they had the cover crop planted, there was 3.36 inches of moisture throughout that soil profile. And where there was not a cover crop planted, there was 3.22 inches of moisture through that soil profile. Okay, so you ask yourself, well, why does that happen? Well, we're going to lose moisture through evaporation, okay? And when we're protecting that soil with the cover crop, you're going to have very, very little evaporation. But that cover crop will use some of that moisture by growing. Okay, so we understand, you know, that we're not losing moisture because of, uh, of evaporation by planting a cover crop. But why was that field the quickest to dry out? Or that was the, the, the field that I planted a cover crop on. Why was that the field that I was able to plant first? Okay, so if you're not losing moisture in that soil profile, what's happening to it? Or why is that top portion of the soil drying out faster? 
Well, it all comes down to increased water infiltration. Not only because you've increased the aggregation size through that soil profile, but you've had roots actually growing in there. Okay, so that gives a, a, a channel for that water to flow through the profile. Um, and it, it just allows not only your water holding capacity to increase, but the rate of which that water infiltration increases. Okay, so you have less runoff by having something growing on there, um, and, it, and it just goes through the profile rather than sitting on top of that profile. Okay, so the next goal that a lot of producers are trying to accomplish is, is trying to alleviate some compaction with the use of cover crops. And really the layers of compaction that we're going to try to alleviate are both the plow layer and the subsoil areas within that profile. If you have something growing, you're really not going to see a lot of surface crusting. As long as you're not doing field work when that ground is, is wet and then we see a hot dry spell, you know, that's when you get that surface crusting. And when you get anything to pop up through that top inch of the soil, it alleviates that surface crusting. But what we need to do is we need to get down through that soil profile and alleviate that plow layer and that subsoil compaction, okay? These are the areas that, you know, in the fall, if our soil is saturated and we're out there with, with big machinery, you know, we're driving semis on there, we have huge grain carts, huge combines, now all of our equipment's larger than it's ever been. And so we're seeing a little bit um, more compaction issues that way. Also, you know, you're gonna increase your compaction in that plow layer just by doing simple field work as well. So if we can grow a crop that has a huge, large taproot and it can get down in that soil profile and break up some of that compaction, that's what we want to try to do. Okay, so here are the, the crops that are going to accomplish that goal. And you can see the picture there. That's a picture of a radish. Um, so you can see just how long that is. That, that radish there is about 18 inches long. It's got, a, you know, about a two inch girth of a, of a tuber there um, and that's going through that profile and it's just alleviating and it's aerating that whole soil. Some of those other crops up there do a pretty good job of, of getting down deep in the profile as well but our radish is by far and away the best species to plant if you want to go deep and you want to alleviate some compaction issues. So I just have a few pictures here of radishes doing some neat things. Uh, this was taken out in a cover crop field, and as I stated earlier, you know, we got pretty dry here in eastern South Dakota. You can, when you go out in your field, you see those big cracks out on the surface. Well, you know, we have a big crack here, but you also have a radish growing up through that crack and just totally breaking that soil apart. That's a pretty neat picture. This is really a, just a large radish that I was able to find. You can say I even broke it off so it was longer than what it is pictured here. Another whopper of a radish. Okay, so we're done with talking about compaction. The next thing is really trying to fix some nitrogen with, with cover crops. And you're mainly going to accomplish this with legumes, okay? Legumes are going to produce more nitrogen that than what is there in the soil. But another thing that you're doing with cover crops, whenever you have something growing, you're going to use up nutrients in that soil. And nitrogen is one of those nutrients that we know leaches. So if we can capture it and use it before it leaches and tie it up in that plant material so that it's saved in a stable form, that's a huge benefit of growing cover crops. But the main thing I want to touch on here with nitrogen fixing is when we're planting cover crops, we're planting species like you know, some vetches, peas, different clovers. And these are probably things that our soil has never seen before. And each specific legume requires a, a specific strain of bacteria to actually convert atmospheric nitrogen into nitrate. So it's important to be inoculating these legumes with that specific strain of bacteria, all right? That's the main point I really wanted to get across with this, with this slide here. I do have a, a cover crop guide that I've put together and also have that on the website under the cover crop tab. And 
If you go to that cover crop tab, you can click on each individual species and it'll take, a, take you to a picture of the plant as well as the seed. Uh, but this slide here just highlights uh, what those legumes are that, that are most common for these cover crop plantings. All right, so we, we also have a lot of um, saline areas in South Dakota. As we've seen wet areas or wet years, we've seen our water table increase. So as that water rises and the profile it comes to the top of the surface, that water gets evaporated and those salts are left on the soil profile. So we need something to either um, filter those salts back through the soil profile or we need plants that are able to transpire and actually breathe and take up those salts and have a high salt content within that plant and are still able to survive. So there's three ways that we can um, try to alleviate those saline areas within our field. Uh, the first thing is, you know, we can try to flush them through, um, but we can't accomplish that. If our water table is high, you're not going to flush anything through the soil profile. You could tile, um, but the main thing, or, or really what the best practice in my mind is, is growing salt tolerant crops. And in this picture here, this is a picture of um, a beardless variety of barley called haybet and it makes an excellent forage. Okay, so barley is very salt tolerant, but the best thing is, is you're gonna go in there and you're gonna harvest that crop and you're gonna totally take off all the, that plant material um, that has some of those salts in it, so you're not leaving it on that soil profile, um, you're taking it away from the crop. So if you have cattle, this is a pretty darn good crop to grow in those saline areas. Um, some of the other very saline tolerant crops that are most used in cover crops, sugar beets are a good one, um, rape is another good one, and Winfred is, is really a hybrid rape that also has very good saline tolerance. All right, talking about forage and utilizing cover crops for forage, you could plant about anything and graze it and you're going to have good luck with it, but there are certain um, certain mixes that work better than others in terms of grazing. So what we're trying to do is, you know, we're trying to get rid of some of that winter feed cost. We're trying to prolong that, that nasty habit of feeding hay in the winter. And we want those cows out working for us. We want them out on the cover crop grazing and, and uh, you know, so that we're not, so that we're putting up less hay and, and we're really diminishing those, those winter feed costs. So these here are some of the plants that are going to work best for grazing cover crops. Um, you know, the, 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 the cereal grains, oats, barleys, things like that. Um, things that are going to yield well, but things that also have good late season palatability and late season nutrition. So grazing cover crops for a lot of producers is, is pretty new idea and uh, their cows haven't ever been eaten these cover crops and so they have a lot of questions um, but the one thing to keep in mind is you know the time of year that you're grazing cover crops uh, you know if it's early uh, September October time and we're coming off of pastures that have gone dormant and you turn them out on this cover crop that's a pretty abrupt change in their diet all right so we're going to a nutritional plan that's low in protein to one that's high in protein you know, one that's very low in moisture to one that's very high in moisture. So we just, we want to be able to introduce them slowly to that, or we at least want to turn them out there on a full room, and, okay? So the other things to keep in mind is, since there is so much moisture in these lush growing cover crops, if you can offer a little bit of dry grass hay when they're out there, that's a, a good thing that's going to acclimate them to it slowly. But the other thing you can do is you can, put mixes of cover crops together that are that are going to be better for grazing. Um, put things in there like sorghum sudan grass or millet, oats, things that aren't going to have such a high moisture content. They're going to have a higher percentage of dry matter. That way when they're grazing turnips and things that do have a high moisture content, they're able to balance their diet a little bit. Um, because, you know, when we do turn them out there and it's, it's lush and it's green, it's high moisture and it's extremely uh, palatable, they will get a little bit loose and so we just want to 
to, to try to alleviate some of those problems. The other thing to keep in mind is since it is a, a totally new thing that they've never really grazed before, it might take them just a little bit of time for them to adapt to the taste of, of these brassica species. Uh, they'll nibble at them a little bit, but once they do figure it out, they, they'll eat them, they'll figure it out. And the other thing that they won't do is the, they won't choke on turnips. I get that question quite often. Are they gonna shove a whole turnip in their mouth and choke and die on it? And they really won't. A, a turnip is pretty soft. They're able to move it around in their jaw. If they do pull up a whole turnip, and, and they'll bite it and they'll break it apart quite easily. And they, and they really won't. So the huge benefit of these brassicas is their nutrition. Uh, protein levels ranging anywhere from 15 up to 22% protein. Uh, like I talked about earlier, their moisture content is pretty high. Uh, but their late season palatability is excellent. They have very, very good cold tolerance. So you can have some early frost there in, in October. It's not even going to nip them. I mean, you're going to have to have um, temperatures in the teens to, to really kill these brassica species or set them back. But they'll hold their nutrition late in the year. So it, it allows you to either turn out pears and give those calves an extra boost before weaning or allows you to, to turn out you know, bread cows late in the fall or early in the winter and, and just kind of coast through the winter, giving them that extra um, protein to, to increase their, their uh, nutritional plane uh, before going into the winter months. Uh, the other thing is they do regrow pretty well and we're starting to see some of these cover crop plantings being done early in the spring and, and guys utilizing them through uh, like mob grazing or rotational grazing systems or strip grazing. And if you give them about 30 days of, of rest, they'll regrow quite, quite well as, as well. So this is just a video. All right, we're out here in Castlewood, South Dakota, looking at another cover crop field. What we got going on out here is is a mixture of a late season grazing uh, cover crop field. And this guy had a couple different fields. We did one with an earlier season grazing, which he has the cows in now. And then he's going to come into this late season grazing mix, mix in just a couple of weeks. Uh, we got some amazing growth out here. This was planted in July after an oats harvest. We got purple top turnips that are bigger than softball. of millet and forage sorghum out here that's done good too. The producer's extremely happy with what they've seen. And I know he's going to be even happy when the cows go off and he can see what they've gained after being out of this cover crop. The Whopper! Okay, so step two in that whole process of designing your cover crop mix is really understanding your crop rotation. And the majority of the cover crops are being planted after a wheat harvest and then guys are wanting to go back to corn. So the thing to keep in mind is the percentage of broadleaves that you have, right? You want your cover crop or you want your crop rotation uh, to stay diversified. So since we're going from a cool season grass to a warm season grass, if we can try to incorporate either some cool season or warm season broadleaves in there, we know that that's good for soil health. So that's going to include our legumes and our brassica species that are under that whole broadleaf umbrella. Step three in the process. Just know what you're putting out there. You know, when, when you see a, an up and coming event or an up and coming um, business venture idea you have newcomers to the industry and there are plenty of them coming to the cover crop industry right now because guys understand that more people are using them so they want to try to <laughs> to try to sell a little bit of cover crop seed too so know what you're planting know what the germination is and the purity of your seeds look on that label ask you know your seed supplier what you're getting in terms of what's on the label if there's noxious weeds in there there's inert matter look on the tag and, and buy from a reputable source
The time of seeding can really affect the rate of which your plants grow in this cover crop mix. Um, if you're planting after wheat harvest and you get in, in the field and plant your cover crop in August, you should really be sticking with cool season plants. Our, our nights are starting to get a little bit um, cooler for sure. Our days are getting shorter. And warm season plants, they aren't really going to thrive like a cool season plant. Now, if you can get in there in July, or if you're planting prevent plant acres to a cover crop, and even at the end of June, early July, then it's time to plant a warm season plant because they're going to thrive more. So the timing of your seeding and when you're planting it really determines whether you'll put a warm season or a cool season blend together. The other thing to keep in mind is uh, the maturity of that species. What you don't want to have happen is you don't want that plant to set seed and make viable seed uh, so you have volunteers that next year. So you want something that's a little bit later maturing and, and you want to know if it's going to freeze out or not. When we do get a lot of snow cover and you have that soil well insulated, some of these plants that are very good in terms of their cold tolerance, they may not freeze out, okay? So that's something to keep in mind in terms of your herbicide control for that following spring. Okay, so when we're putting these big blends together, seed sizes become a bit of an issue, and they'll actually, the, the way that you seed that mix determines what seed sizes you should be planting or how they should be mixed. If you're going to throw it into a drill and you're going to have various seed sizes, just be aware that you may have some seed separation. Um, I'm, I'm seeing less and less of it because we're able to, to put such diverse seed sizes together. So as long as you're not putting like a turnip seed, which is very, very fine, with an oat seed and just planting those two species, you'll probably be fine with, with mixing a lot of different seed sizes together. Okay, but if you have the opportunity to separate small seed sizes from large seed sizes, and you know, you can put them in two different takes in your air, seas, air seeder, I would definitely recommend it. We're seeing pretty good results that way. Um, but the method of which you seed that cover crop does affect how much seed you should put out there. If you're wanting to broadcast it, definitely increase your population rate. Um, and, it, and if you're air seeding it, then you're probably going to be able to decrease your population rate a little bit as well. Step six in that process is Depending on where your cover crop is planted, ultimately, you know, depends on what you're going to plant as well. So your growing season, for one, um, but if you're in, in eastern South Dakota and if you have extremely good yield on your wheat, you have a lot of stubble, um, the rate of your brassicas can increase because they'll eat up some of that residue. Now, if you're in western South Dakota, you want to hold that residue, you want to hold some of that um, decaying wheat straw in your soil to catch snow to protect that soil. And so you, your rate of brassicas within that cover crop uh, mix should really be less than 30% of your entire mix. So just know that brassicas will eat up some of that residue. And if you want to keep or if you want to eat up some of that residue, your bra the percentage of brassicas within that mix should be altered. All right, so then ultimately, how are we going to get rid of that cover crop? Are you going to graze it off? Are you going to just allow it to freeze and then you're going to plant into it that following spring? Are you going to do some tillage work? Or are you going to spray it out? Okay, so we have to take into consideration that if you're going to go and you're planting and spraying it out in the fall, if you have a lot of growth um, and that, that root structure is well developed, Roundup probably is not going to kill a lot of these brassica species um, because it's a big, strong, robust growing plant. Um, the other thing to take into consideration is when you get a lot of this growth, how are you going to get through that field if you do want to do some sort of tillage, some sort of tillage work? You know, if we have just this big jungle of growing things, uh, you're going to see some wrapping with some of these plants. And so if, if you plan on doing those things, um, you know, we can adjust a mix so that you're still able to do um, those things to get rid of your cover crop. Uh, but the other thing to, to really keep in mind is these plants that are growing, they have a lot of moisture in them. When they freeze out, 
the rate of decomposition is pretty rapid. And this is a video that I shot last winter showing how they do city valves and how they break down. I'm uh, Justin after Ricky Ford, specialist with Melbourne Seeds. So take a look at that video as well. It's up on our YouTube, Florida, YouTube channel. Uh, and this is a mixture of some radishes, chickling vetch, sun hemp, and there's also some Ethiopian cabbage. Uh, and the main reason we came up to shoot a film in this field is I got a lot of concerns here in fall uh, with producers asking, what do I do with my cover crop field? Uh, and their fields were probably knee high uh, of this growth and, and they needed to get back in spring and plant into this in the, into this jungle. And, and my advice to every single one of them was just wait, be patient, let Mother Nature do its role, and let a frost come in and break down some of this uh, some of this matter. And you can see how this radishes and these Ethiopian cabbages have really started to break down. These leaves are turning to mush. The stalks there's about nothing left of them, and that's exactly what we wanted the frost to do. Now, if you wanted to come in after that frost and maybe do some strip till like this producer's done, I, th I still think that's a, a good idea to kind of open up that ground a little bit more. Uh, but I think going forward with next year, I'm still going to say the exact same thing is just be patient, let a frost come in, and start breaking down some of this stuff before you, before you come in to do any field work. Uh, so we have a great example of what a frost can do to help you out in a cover crop field. I'm Justin Frickie with Millborn Seeds, and thanks for watching today. Okay, so this is kind of a, a scenario that we'd go through in terms of how you're going to design that cover crop. So here's Frank. He doesn't want to feed so much hay this winter. He wants to get back to winter, to, to Mexico. He's got to work on that suntan line. Uh, so he's obviously he's trying to make some sort of forage cover crop mix. So here's those six things. Um, his project goal, like we said, he, he wants to, to feed them cows. If he can alleviate some compaction, if he can fix some nitrogen, those are just going to be added bonuses. You can see his crop rotation there. Uh, he's going to plant it in late August. He's going to plant it with a drill. He's in eastern South Dakota. And then he's going to get rid of that cover crop by grazing. So here's that mix that we would come up with. So we still have a lot of diversity in there. We have a legume with a P to fix the nitrogen. We have an excellent grazing mix because we have brassica species in there and then we have a little bit of oats as well to maintain that dry matter level. And then we have those big taproot of brassicas, the radishes, which are going to go down that soil profile and alleviate compaction. So we're achieving all of the goals with this cover crop mix. All right, so these are the three main questions that I get on cover crops. Am I going to use up all my moisture for next spring? Well, probably not. We we did we talked about you know how you're protecting that soil uh, from evaporation. We talked about your infiltration increasing by planting the cover crop. So you're not going to use up all your moisture for next spring. Are your cattle going to get sick? No, they're not going to bloat. That's the one main thing that they won't do off of brassicas. Um, and as long as you're introducing them slowly and you're watching their dry metal intake levels, um, you're not going to have any issues. Okay, so the last thing up there, am I going to use up all my nutrients in my soil? If, if you don't harvest that material from that soil, you're not taking anything away from it. Okay, so let's say you go and uh, you do a soil sample before you plant a cover crop, and you do a soil sample early in the spring before you plant your cash crop, your levels of nutrients are going to be pretty low. And you're going to go, well, I planted a cover crop. Aren't I supposed to be boosting my soil nutrient levels? Well, what you've done is you've taken all those nutrients from the soil profile and you've captured it in plant material. And as that material breaks down, that's when it's going to be released back in that soil profile. So keep that in mind and, and don't think that you're, you're totally have reaped your, your soil in terms of its nutrients. You've just put it in a different state. Um, and it's been, a, you know, it's, it's, it's a very good insurance policy for holding your nutrients by planting a cover crop. 
Okay, so this cover crop is a new idea still, uh, or at least the way that we're doing them now is, is a new idea. And so it takes some trial and error. It takes, it takes an innovator to get a cover crop out there and, and see how it works on their, on their farm, uh, you know, test a few things, see how it works, try a few different species. Okay, this is, you know, I, I always think farmers and ranchers are by far and away the best researchers because they figure out what works for them and they adjust things. You know, it's just unbelievable how farmers can come up with new equipment ideas or, I mean, you just, you're always seeing those odd inventions that farmers come up with. And this is one of those things, okay? Cover crops are, they have to be tried and they have to be researched a little bit, uh, but we've seen so many good results with them that I'm confident that anybody can make them work on their farm and ranch. This is a field of radishes that I planted into um, standing corn on a, on a field that I farm with my brother. And what we did, we, we just broadcasted radishes um, about the 1st of September. We were able to catch some rain and allow that seed to get incorporated into the soil. Germinated extremely well, had a great stand of radishes um, growing through the fall there on that, in that corn stubble. This is an aerial applicator that's being used in, uh, in, in Illinois for broadcasting cover crops into standing, into standing crops. And the last thing I really want to do is to wrap up this whole concept. You know, as we see land value increase and we see input costs rising, anytime we have an opportunity to try to decrease those up or those input costs, we need to take advantage of it. You know, there's a whole big talk about being more sustainable, that we need to be self-sustainable on our farms, and I'm not sure that we need to be self-sustainable because there's so many opportunities with utilizing technology and bringing those technology opportunities back to our farms and making ourselves more efficient, and we need to do that, but if we can be a little bit more sustainable in the amount of nutrients that we're applying to our fields or the amount of feed that we're feeding, that's a great thing. And that's what cover crops do. They create healthy soil and they create an economical food source. Okay? So it really, that, those are the main reasons why we're planting cover crops. And that's why we're seeing such um, momentum gains or, or such popularity increases in cover crops. So I thank you for, for listening and tuning in. If you have any questions, shoot me an email, give me a call, and I'd love to talk more about cover crops. Thanks for